In this lecture, we're going to solve the wave equation, which is a linear uh, PDE. We're going to combine it with some boundary conditions. And we're going to use the method of separation of variables and Fourier series. So this particular presentation is all about combining our knowledge from the last few weeks on Fourier series and separation of variables. Now this is quite a long presentation, so you need to get comfortable. Okay, relax, get comfortable. One of the, this presentation may, might be long, but it is related to what we already know about the heat equation in some sense. So you can look at, look at the ideas, especially in the first half of the solution, that they will better inform your understanding of the way we solve the heat equation. Okay. So, here's a particular problem. This PDE here is a second order partial differential equation known as the heat equation. It's linear. And essentially what I'm going to do is just solve this problem step by step using the separation of variables method. So let's discuss each, each part of the problem and see if we could um, form some sort of picture of what's going on. So here we have a PDE. The 9 is a constant that's related to the wave speed. You, in general, we have a C squared next to the U sub XX, where C is the wave, known as the wave speed. Okay, so in this case, C squared is 9, so C is positive, it would be 3. Now, in this case, suppose we've got a string that's got its ends clamped or fixed at x equals 0 and x equals pi. Okay? Now, think of this curve here as representing the, the string at some point in, in time. U of x comma t measures the displacement of the string above or below its equilibrium position. So that distance there would be the displacement at the point x at a certain time t. So what I've drawn there will give you a, a snapshot of the whole string at a certain point in time. And the string, you know, we, we um, have the, the ends clamped. That's what these two boundary conditions mean. And these two conditions, this is the initial displacement of the string. And this is the initial velocity of the string. So in this case, what we do is we, we start with this. Displace it by plucking it, say and we let it go from rest. And then the string's going to vibrate up and down. What is the, how can we predict the displacement of the string at all points x along the um, horizontal axis and any time t in the future? So that, that, that's the idea. Now you can see the initial displacement here, or the initial pluck, is given by a particular function. So if I was to draw that function in, it's going to look something like a triangle. Okay, so this then is the sort of initial starting position of the string. Okay, so 
Seven means the ends are clamped so that, that they don't um, uh, vibrate or move in any way. The set of conditions eight gives us the initial displacement and the u sub t of x comma zero is the initial velocity. In this case, the velocity, initial velocity is zero. The strings are uh, uh, released from rest. Okay, now we've looked at already the heat equation with separation of variables and the idea with the solution to this problem is very similar. The key assumption is to assume that solutions to six have some special form. In particular, the form is the product of two functions, one that only depends on position, x, and the other only depends on time, little t. And then what we do is we introduce the boundary conditions and the initial conditions gradually and then suitably adjust the form of our solution. Okay, so that's what we're going to work through in this lesson. Now I'm going to go through it in a step-by-step -step approach. Okay, well, firstly, let's look at the derivatives in our PDE. U sub xx and U sub tt, where the subscripts mean partial derivatives, right? U sub xx is d squared u dx squared, partial derivative. So what we would do is we would start with this boxed form and calculate all the derivatives that lie in our PDE. Then I would substitute in and form two ODEs, two ordinary differential equations. So let's do that. So let's call this, um, okay, that's eight, let's call this nine. Okay, so let's take the derivatives, partial derivatives of this with respect to x and, and t. Now, when we differentiate these things partially, it's a simple case because the variables are separated here. So we're going to get something like the following. Okay, now by the dash here, I just mean the regular ordinary derivative with respect to the independent variable. Okay, so just going to the same one just with, with respect to t this time, little t. I'll get something like this. And then if I differentiate again, here with respect to x, little x, and over here with respect to little t, I'll get the following. So now what I want to do is take those bottom two derivatives and substitute them back into my heat equation, my original PDE. So I would replace this with 9 times that, and this with what we have here. Okay? Okay, so what I'm going to get, I'm going to get something like 9 big X double prime times big T equals big X times big T double prime. Okay, so anyone remember what we want to do now? Separate the variables, right? So in other words, we want to get all the X's on one side and all the T's on the other side.
Okay, so I'm going to bring that big X over here and the 9 big T over here. So this is very similar to what we did with the heat equation, but there's a small difference. In the heat equation, we only had one derivative on this right-hand side. Now we've got two. So that makes it a little bit different. OK, well, we can now try to justify the existence of a separation constant. So now what we can do is argue that there is a separation constant, say gamma, such that these two ratios are equal to a constant. So let's just write down some justification for that. So since the left-hand side, uh, the left-hand side of this, this equation only depends on little x. And the right-hand side only depends on little t. I claim that these ratios must be equal to a constant. And the justification for that would be, all right, well, let's look at the left-hand side. If I vary little x, you would expect the left-hand side to change. But the right-hand side doesn't depend on x, and these things are equal. So this can't, ch can't change. Similarly, the right-hand side depends on little t. If I vary little t, I would expect the expression to change. But the left-hand side doesn't depend on little t, so the left-hand side can't change. So the only explanation for this is that there must be a separation constant. So I'm going to drop the um, independent variables now, just to save a bit of space. OK. Now we don't know what gamma is, but we're going to discuss a few different cases. And in particular, once we've rearranged those equations, our aim is to find the values of gamma that lead to a non-trivial solution, a non-zero solution. Okay? So let's rearrange this. I can sort of bring the x up there and rearrange to get one ODE in big X, and I can rearrange this, this part to get an ODE in big T. They'll both be second order, second order ODEs, linear, homogeneous. Okay, so just rearranging these equations, I'll get the following. Okay, now when we did the heat equation, we would solve for big T straight away because it was a first order problem. But now it's slightly more difficult because we've got a second order problem. So I'm going to leave that for a while and come back to it. What I'm going to work on first is this equation. And the reason for that is basically due to the boundary conditions. Okay? These two boundary conditions are well suited to forming um, uh, boundary conditions for big X. So let's call this, um, say, big A and big B. We'll return to big, big A at some point. So how do we solve second order linear, say, homogeneous problems with constant coefficients? You write down the characteristic equation. So for this one, 
For B, the characteristic equation would be something like um, lambda squared minus gamma equals zero. So if I rearrange that, it's just lambda squared equals gamma. Okay, so if we can determine the roots, lambda, then I can write down the solution, big X of little x to B. But we, again, we don't know what gamma is. Is gamma positive? Is gamma negative? Is gamma zero? We have to consider all three cases. Okay, so let's consider the simplest case when gamma is zero. When gamma is zero, the characteristic equation is lambda squared equals zero. So lambda equals zero or zero. The roots are real and equal. So you'll get something like this. Alternatively, just put in, replace this with zero and solve double, X, double big X prime equals zero by integration. Okay, big A and big B are constants. Okay. Uh, let's look at the case when gamma is positive. When gamma is positive, what kind of roots am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get something like um, real and unequal roots. Okay. So in that case, what do we know? Well, we know that the general solution is a linear combination of exponential functions. Okay, so if I take the square root of both sides, I get plus or minus root gamma. Okay, so the roots are real and unequal in that case. And the last case, which is going to turn out to be the one of interest, is the case when gamma is negative. In that case, our characteristic equation is going to yield complex solutions. Now, in particular, the solutions will be complex with zero real part. So in that case, it's just a linear combination of cosine and sine. Now note what I'm writing here does make sense, root negative gamma, because we're talking about the case when gamma is negative. So negative gamma will be positive. Okay, now throughout here big A and big B are constants. Okay, so now what, what we want to do is actually concentrate on this, this function, big X, and solve for big A and big B, the constants, in each case. Okay, so what we can do now is start introducing some of the information that we haven't used yet. In particular, let's, let's, let's introduce 7. Again, this is very similar to what we did with the heat equation. So this isn't a minus sign here, this is just sort of a continuation. Okay. Now assuming this form, both of these boundary conditions give me some sort of boundary condition for big X. So the boundary condition 7 and the form 9 give the following. Well, that's our left-hand boundary condition. 
And from our form of solution, our assumed form of solution, it'll be this. And the second boundary condition in 7 gives the following. Now, if you look at the two bottom equations, either big T is 0 for all little t, not interested in that case because that will give us the trivial solution, or big X of 0 is 0 and big X of pi is 0. They're the, one, they're the um, uh, boundary conditions that we want. So we can then take them and go back and analyze these cases here. Okay, so ignore the case big T is identically equal to zero because that just gives you the trivial solution. Not interested in that. Okay, so let's take this information and discuss each case separately. Now the first case, when gamma equals 0, well this case is going to give me a times 0 plus b equals 0. So actually I'm going to get b equals 0 there. And the second boundary condition is going to give me a pi plus b equals 0. b is 0, pi can't be 0, so a has got to be 0. So if we look at the first case, when the separation constant gamma is 0, we just get big X equals 0 here leads to this trivial solution, not interested in that. Okay. The second case, when our separation constant is positive, if you look, uh, use this first boundary condition here, you'll get a plus, uh, big A plus big B equals 0. And the second condition will also give you a relationship between big A and big B. Now it turns out that that's also going to give you big A equals 0, big B equals 0, those two equations. And if you look at the third case, well, if you sub in little x equals 0, that's going to be 0 instead of all equal to 0, that's going to be just A times 1. In the third case, big A equals 1. But if you use this condition, then you're going to get some good information out of that uh, sine function. Okay, so let's write some of that down. Well, what are they going to, they're going to yield, the following, So we just get the trivial solution, big X. Let's look at the case where the separation constant's positive. Well, what, what are we going to get there? Well, the first one's going to give us a plus b equals 0. And the second one's going to give us a e to the 
root gamma pi plus b e to the minus root gamma pi equals zero. So you can put the first equation into the second equation and then factor out either a or b depending on what you want. So if you put these in one into the other, you'll get something like this. Oh, pi. Now, expression in the square bracket can't be zero. The only way it can be zero is when gamma is zero. But gamma is not zero in this case. Gamma is positive. So that the only explanation then is that big A equals zero. If big A equals zero, big B has also got to equal zero. So now we, we've ruled out the case when the separation constant is positive. The last case is when the separation constant is negative. And this is going to give us the good, the good stuff. Okay, so in this case, if we go back to our little chart, what are we going to get? Well, if we sub in the left-hand condition, we're going to get big A equals zero. Okay. And if we sub in the right hand condition, we're going to get. Okay, that's got to be zero then. We're going to get B sine root negative gamma pi. So this now is what we want to work with. This bottom right hand corner, if it's zero, one of two things happens. Either big B is zero or the sine function is zero. Now if big B is zero, well, we get the trivial solution again. So we don't want that, right? So sine, let's work with setting sine of this equal to zero and see what happens. Okay, so let's work with this. <coughs> okay, so when is the sine function zero? Well, it's zero at pi, two pi, three pi, four pi etc. Right? n pi where n's a, an integer. Now you can see that we can sc uh, scrape off the pi's and we form a sequence of values. So, what we can do now is go back to this setup, this is going to be zero, and I can replace root minus gamma with n, where n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So actually, what we've got is a sequence of functions now, big X. Okay? If we have a sequence of functions, then we need a sequence of arbitrary constants to go with them.
So let's actually write down this sort of sequential form. So the B sub n's are all constant here. Okay, so, so this look should look familiar from the heat equation. Not much has, has changed. Okay? So now, I told you before that we'd come back to this second order problem involving big T. We're only interested in the case um, when, uh, when we have this and the um, gamma's negative. So let's solve this when gamma's negative, and in particular when the relationship um, between uh, gamma and n is, is uh, labelled here. Okay, this was our setup. Okay, well, we can write down the characteristic equation for this one as well. Now, the nice thing about the already having the separation constant there and knowing its, its sign is that, and in fact, its, its values, is that we don't have to discuss all the different cases. The, the sign of the separation constant is already set. So the characteristic equation say minus 9 gamma equals 0 and since gamma is negative we can have complex roots with zero real parts. Okay, so if I want to get this in terms of n, I can just sort of replace this with this. Again, we can form a sequence of functions, big T. Okay, so instead of writing this in my cosines and, and sines, let's put it in, in this form and form a sequence straight away. All right. Now the C sub ends. It's just a sequence of constants. The d sub n's are a sequence of constants. We don't know what they are, but we want to determine them. Okay, so what, what have we got left to do now? Well, the usual practice now is to multiply these two things together, just like our original form, and then somehow find out these arbitrary constants. Now, because we're dealing with linear homogeneous equations, we can use the rule of superposition. Right? If we have a sequence of uh, solutions, then we can sum them all up, and that will form a new, more uh, general form of solution. So let's do that. And then what we're going to do is use the initial conditions to calculate these, these uh, constants. So now we have like a sequence of functions. 
which is something like this. So this is a capital C here. And if I, say, expand this out or just simplify the two um, sequences of constants that are multiplied together, let's just simplify the notation a little bit. Let, let this product be little b sub n and let the other product be little d sub n. Okay? Now we can use the law of, of superposition to sum up. Okay? Linear and homogeneous. We can form the following. We sum over the ends. Okay, so we form an infinite sum here. And we get something like the following. So note these are subscripts, B sub n and D sub n. Okay. So that is our general form now. It looks quite long and it's quite messy, but that is our general form. The only thing we need to do now is calculate the B sub n's and the D sub n's. If we have that, then we're finished. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to use the initial conditions. I'm going to use the, uh, we haven't used any form of um, Conditions 8 yet. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use 8. Okay. Well, let's consider the first condition. Okay, let's forget about the actual form of our initial displacement. Let's just consider this. What I would do is go to this general form and plug in little t equals 0. What's going to happen? Well, that's going to be 0, so that term's going to disappear, and that's going to become 1. So what does that look like if I cover everything up? <coughs> Fourier sine series. Okay? So I'm just going to leave it in the f of x form, and I'll worry about the, the particular form later. So go up here, plug in little t equals 0. That's going to disappear. That's going to become 1, and I get the following. So, how can I calculate the B sub n's? Well, I can extend f of x as an odd function and then use the integration formula from Fourier series to compute the B sub n's. Okay, so if I wanted to sort of highlight this a bit more, this is just the Fourier sine series for f. Okay, now in this case, our, our region of interest is 0 to pi. So if we extend f as a periodic function that's odd, work on the interval minus pi to pi, L here, remember, is half the, the period. So L would be um, pi here. Okay, so in this case, it would be 2 on pi, integral from 0 to pi, f of x, where, where f's 
in 8, and so you would integrate that. Okay? So to do that, what you would do is just break, break the integral up into two inter integrals, 0 to pi on 2 and pi on 2 to pi. So you would have to do two integrations for that one with this particular f of x. Okay, so that gives us one way of computing the b sub n's. What about the d sub n's? Once we've got that, we're finished. Okay? Now, what's the other condition in 8? Well, the string is released from rest. So what I can do is go up to my general form, differentiate it with respect to t, assuming we can differentiate under the summation sign, which is, in this case, we can. So take partial derivatives, and then plug in little t equals 0. You're going to get a sine there, which will become 0. You're going to get something like a cosine there, which will become 1 when little t equals 0. And you'll come up with the following. Okay, so differentiate under the summation sign, and you'll get the following. Okay, it's a bit messy. So this is all evaluated at little t equals zero. Okay, so I've differentiated term by term under the summation sign. Okay, so let's plug in t equals zero. Well, this first term is going to be zero. The second term is going to be 3 times n times d sub n sine nx. Now, does that look slightly familiar? It looks like a Fourier sine series. And if I just call 3n d sub n some new sequence, k sub n, how can I compute the k's? Well, I can use the theory of Fourier series, Fourier sine series. But actually, it's simpler than that. What's the Fourier sine series of zero? What do you think? Zero. Okay. I've got, I've got a, a function, zero. Zero is an, an, an uh, odd function, but it's also an even function. Right? So if I'm going to express it in terms of odd functions, it better be all be zero. So the d sub n... can be calculated in the following way. These coefficients must be zero. Okay, obviously the three's not zero, the n's not zero, so the d sub n's must be zero. Okay, so what does it mean to this second term in our summation? It's zero. So actually our solution form simplifies greatly. Okay? So our general form, we know how to calculate the b sub n's. The d sub n's are all zero, so that's going to be my general form, where the b sub n's are given by this.
Okay, so the f of x is given here. So to actually compute these, the actual full solution, you would have to go through and do the integration. Okay, now I'll leave that for you to do. That's a fair bit of work though. So let me write down the final form of the solution. Okay, so here's the final form of solution. Now the only reason I've switched to k's down here is because you get some simplification by just summing over the odd terms. So just, just a quick note, little t down here. We should have little t, not x. Okay? Okay? Well, so what? Well, now we can predict the position or the displacement of the string at any point along the axis at any future time t.